<laughs> didn't leave you any, huh? Man, that is not the right thing to say to somebody. <laughs> no, it was big. It was, was all ice. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to talk to you this evening about Antarctica, and particularly about a ongoing project we have at a place in Antarctica called Mount Wishy. And some of you might think, what are we <coughs> doing hearing about Antarctica in Hawaii? But there are quite a few connections there. First, New Mexico Tech has a long-standing research program in Antarctica, mostly geology, but other topics as well. Also, Antarctica has volcanoes, and Hawaii has volcanoes. And then third, back in the day when Bill and I were first going to Antarctica, the 747 planes couldn't fly directly from Los Angeles to New Zealand, so we always stopped in Hawaii. And on the way south, we'd stop in Honolulu Airport in the middle of the night, and spend a few hours drinking pineapple juice, and then often on the way home from Antarctica, we would spend a week in Hawaii. And so, so we both have, Bill and I have this um, you know, very affectionate feeling for Hawaii because of spending time here on the way back from Antarctica. And then I think also when I was listening to Nels' talk last night, I noticed another number of other connections that you'll, you'll pick up on as we go through the talk. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, uh, first a little bit about Antarctica, and then a little bit about the scientific motivation for this Mount Weishi project. And then, even though we're in the middle of this project, there are already some really interesting results that have come out of this. So I'll give you a quick snapshot of some of the kind of high-level scientific results that have come out of this. And then the second part of the talk, I'm going to show you what it's like to work in Antarctica. And that's something that, that you know, is, that was always interesting to people. Like, we're out in a super remote place, living in tents, and kind of what is that like? And so I'll tell you a little bit about that and show you kind of how we do our field work in Antarctica. So Antarctica is the world's southernmost landmass and is the highest, driest, and coldest continent on Earth. Antarctica is about one and a half times the size of the United States, and it is almost completely covered in ice. And you can see there are some rocks showing here along the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. And then if you look in this part of Antarctica, uh -oh, the, the elephant's head part of Antarctica, which is called West Antarctica, you can see these little bumps sticking up through the ice. And those are volcanoes that, that are partly covered in ice in West Antarctica. Now, Antarctica is divided into two parts, the East, Antar East Antarctica, which is this part of Antarctica, and West Antarctica. And you might say, well, how do you figure that, East and West Antarctica, given that this <laughs> is the South Pole and everything is North? Right. So the way that, that is determined is East Antarctica is in the Eastern Hemisphere and West Antarctica is in the Western Hemisphere. Um, now, East and West Antarctica are also different in a couple of other ways. Now, I'll show you that in just a minute. But both East and West Antarctica are covered with very thick ice. And the ice in East Antarctica is in many places over 10,000 feet thick. So really tremendous amount of ice. And one of the really cool things that's come out of Antarctic science in the last 10 years or so is they've been able to do geophysical surveys looking through the ice and looking at the underlying topography. And there's a huge mountain range in the middle of West Antarctica called the Gambertsev Mountains that no human being has ever seen because it's completely and these are 10,000 foot peaks, this, this range. And when you look at the geophysical imaging, you can just see this beautiful mountain range that no human being has ever seen. It's completely ice covered. <coughs> West Antarctica, the, the West Antarctica ice sheet's a little bit thinner. It's about 6,000 feet. And um, so, and the, other, the interesting thing about West Antarctica is much of it, if you strip the ice off, and I'll show you an image of that in a minute, much of West Ant the West Antarctic ice sheet is grounded below sea level. So if you strip the ice off West Antarctica, these volcanoes would be sticking through the ice as little islands, but much of it would just be ocean. Whereas East Antarctica, there's a lot of land above sea level. Um, so one of the important thing, one of the things that people are really focusing on in Antarctic research these days is thinking about ice stability. Because the West Antarctic ice sheet, if it completely collapsed into the world's oceans, it would raise global sea level by six feet which is a lot. And if, you know you think, oh, six meters doesn't sound like that much. But yeah. if you look at a map of the world and you raise sea level six meters, it's a completely different picture. Um, so the stability of the West Antarctic ice sheet is a 
really important research topic in Antarctica. Now, East Antarctica, because a lot it's a lot of it's grounded below, above sea level, the the amount of ice in East Antarctica would, if it were in the oceans, would raise global sea level by 30 meters. 60. Well. 60 meters. I'm sorry, that long. So, <coughs> but it would take a long time. The East Antarctic ice sheet couldn't collapse catastrophically; it would collapse slowly. So, so that's something that's not really you know, on the radar screen. But West Antarctica is. Um, another thing that always comes up about Antarctica is who owns Antarctica? And many countries lay claim to parts of Antarctica, mm -hmm. but all of those claims are held in abeyance by the Antarctic Treaty. So all the treaty nations agree that although they have parts of Antarctica that they would, would consider claiming if the treaty didn't exist, for now, all those all, all that's held in abeyance, and it's really a continent that is where scientific research is one of the primary things that happens in Antarctica. Now, tourism is becoming more and more of a thing there too, but most of the people that go to Antarctica are there to do research. So it's really a, a continent devoted to science. Okay, I mentioned what would can someone <coughs> escape from here? Um, this is an image that shows what Antarctica would look like were there no ice on the continent. So everything that is green, yellow, and brown would be above sea level. Everything that's blue would be below sea level. So you can see that much of West Antarctica, if the ice were stripped off, would just be oceanic areas. Although there, these are a lot of the volcanoes that stick up through the West Antarctica sheet. Okay, New Mexico Tech has had a long presence long research presence in Antarctica. And one of the primary focuses of that research is this volcano, Mount Erebus, which is the world's southernmost active volcano. It's a place where I've spent lots of time, Bill has spent even more time, Nels has spent a few field seasons there. It's one of the most phenomenal places I've ever been. So it's a persistent, it's an active volcano that contains a persistent lava lake. And this is what the lava lake looks like. So if you were standing at the summit of Mount Erebus and looking down into the crater where all that gas was coming out in the last image, this is what you see. So this is molten rock. It's 1100 degrees Celsius. It's convecting, overturning. You can see gas being emitted from the lava lake that is largely water vapor, but also CO2, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and hydrochloric acid, plus a whole suite of metals that fractionate from the magma into the volcanic gas. And this is not just a lava lake kind of a static lake. This is a window into a magma chamber. So you're seeing the top of a magmatic system. It's incredibly, it's an incredibly useful natural laboratory for understanding volcanoes. That's a whole other topic. But this is one of the youngest rocks honored at the time that I was standing by it. So this is a volcanic bomb that was just erupted out of that lava lake. Erebus erupts a couple times a day, Strombolian eruptions, hurls these bombs into the air, they slam down on the sides of the volcano. And you can see a lot of the rocks in the background here are bombs that have been erupted in the past. But this one was just erupted. And Nell showed yesterday in his talk the red hot lava that is what entrances a lot of geologists. And there you have it. So, <laughs> so this is the pick of my ice axe and I chopped into that volcanic bomb. And here is red, red lava on the interior of that bomb. And uh, again, it's hard to, hard to describe how exciting that is. So. Um, <laughs> Did you sample it? Yes, we did. Yeah, we sampled all the young bombs. And that's actually <coughs> interesting because Ere the composition of the Erebus bombs has been consistent for a tremendously long time. And so we do sample the bombs every year to get you know another point in that record of the, the composition of the Erebus lava lake. But that whole magmatic system has been in equilibrium for thousands of years, which is interesting. Um, so so Erebus, Erebus is considered a red? Volcano? Red. Versus gray? I mean, uh, uh, kind of like the volatility. It's active. Index, so. It's certainly active. active. But it is not a particularly dangerous volcano yeah. because, because it's an open system. So the reason volcanoes erupt really explosively is because gas gets trapped in the magma chamber, right. builds up no, pressure, and no boom. Release. But yeah. Erebus is an open system, it's, it's degassing all the time. So the chances of having a really big eruption are quite small. Now, if the whole conduit geometry changed, and we know Erebus has had really big eruptions in the past, 
and the, the shape of Erebus, it kind of goes up and then there's a break and slope. That was, that break and slope is a caldera that was produced by a really big eruption. Probably it was 37,000 years ago. Um, and there's volcanic ash spread all over parts of Antarctica from that eruption. So Erebus does have the potential. And also the main US base, the Inferno Station, is 30 kilometers from Mount Erebus. So um, it's a, you know, we definitely keep an eye on it. But in its current configuration, it's unlikely to really produce a very dangerous eruption. Now you talked about the similarities. Does it similar to Mauna Loa as far as the nature of the uh, beast? Or? Yeah, you know, it's most similar to Mount Etna in Italy. Oh. But uh, this was something I was going to mention too about a similarity between Antarctica and Hawaii is Mount Erebus is on an island, Ross Island that is composed of three, four actually coalesced volcanoes. Kind of like the island of Hawaii is composed of five coalesced volcanoes. Okay. Now the, co the composition is, is not exactly the same. One of the volcanoes on, on Ross Island where Erebus lives is a shield volcano like Mauna Loa. But Erebus is really more of a stratovolcano. It's, it's got a higher, it's a steeper slope volcano. Um, so even though Erebus is kind of the coolest volcano in Antarctica and erupts all the time, there are a number of other volcanoes in Antarctica. And the ones shown in the red stars here are ones that are recently active, including Mount Takibi, Berlin, Melbourne, and the Pleiades. And then there's a couple of other volcanoes that I've labeled here that are no longer active, including Mount Weishi, the volcano I'm gonna talk about today, and Mount Moulton, another interesting volcano in West Antarctica. Um, so, uh, this is what, That, that mm -hmm. zero degrees up here, is, is that the meridian, does that go through Greenwich? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know, but he knows it. Um, so, West Antarctica. This is what a lot of West Antarctica looks like. And this is actually what a lot of East Antarctica looks like, too. It's flat and white. But here's a volcano. This is Mount Taki, a volcano that protrudes up through the Antarctic ice sheet. Now, these volcanoes are 10, 11, 12, up to 14,000 feet high. So, so as big as Mount Rainier. But the bottom half of the volcanoes is completely buried. And so only the top part of the volcanoes shows. And how do we know these volcanoes are active? We know they're active because we visited them and dated recent deposits, but we also know they're active because when you drill through the ice in West Antarctica, you get these ice cores, and one of the things you see in these ice cores are these dark bands, which are layers of volcanic ash from explosive eruptions. And this is what Nels did his PhD work on, is integrating the record of volcanism in West Antarctica by looking at the ice cores. And the ice cores are cool because they catch eruptions from all the different volcanoes. So you go to you know you go to Mount Berlin and study the eruptions from Mount Berlin. That only tells you about Mount Berlin. But in the ice cores, you see records of all the different eruptions that are happening. So Mount Weishi. This is a project. It's an NSF funded project, and the project was funded for two field seasons. The idea was to have a field season, and then a lab year, and then a second field season. Our first field season was in 2018, 2019. We had a terrific season. That's what I'm going to talk about mostly today. Then we had the lab season, and then COVID hit. So we were supposed to be in Antarctica this winter, but um, McMurdo Station had a huge explosion of COVID, and we've been postponed to next year. So next year, we will be doing our second field season at Mount Wichita. So Mount Weishi is part of what's called the Executive Committee Range, which is a, a chain of volcanoes. The oldest one about 14 million years old and younging progressively to the youngest volcano, Mount Weishi, which has eruptions that are 100,000 years old and less. Um, now, if you, there is a rift similar to the Rio Grande Rift that runs through West Antarctica, and hence that, that low area that's below sea level. And the volcanoes are mostly on the flanks of that rift. So here's the executive committee range. And all of these volcanoes are related to this rift and likely an associated hotspot, like what <coughs> forms the volcanoes of Hawaii. Okay, so what are the objectives of this work? There's lots of different objectives of this work, but the main reason we are at Mount Weishi is to understand past ice sheet history. And how do you use a volcano to understand past ice sheet history? There's a couple of different ways. And this, when we were coming out of, the, of Mount Weishi in the first field season, we came through a drilling camp. And then Bill and I, because of some bad weather, 
and only four seats on an aircraft. Four people in our field, in our field team went back to McMurdo. Bill and I got stuck at this drilling camp for five days. Um, and they asked us to give a talk. And this is Bill's cartoon <laughs> of our science project at Mount Weishi, which is actually really great. Um, and we could have done a you know, fancier illustration, but I thought, oh, this. So one of the ways you can understand something about past ice sheet history is to work up the sides of the volcano. And so here's current ice level. If you climb up the sides of the volcano and you look at the volcanic products on the flanks of the volcano, you can tell by looking at that material if it was erupted in air or if it interacted with ice. And Nels mentioned this in his talk yesterday about high alkalastites, where magma interacts with ice. So if we map the lava flows on the sides of the volcano, we can look for evidence of interaction between ice and magma. And then by determining the elevation and the age, we can say, OK, 27,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, the ice was 400 meters thicker than it is today. So that's one thing that we've done in a lot of the West End of volcanoes. But the thing we're doing at Mount Weishi, which is super interesting, is we're, this tells us when the ice sheet was thicker. But, in, but what we really want to know is when the ice sheet was thinner. And that is a much more complicated problem. So the way we're going to do that is we are mapping lava flows on the flanks of Mount Weishi that are partly covered with ice. Now, we know they're down there because we've done radar work to determine where they are. And then in our next field season, we're going to drill through the ice, sample the lava flows under the ice, and do something called cosmogenic isotopes, which tells us if those lavas have been exposed to cosmic rays during their lifetime. So if we are able to sample a lava flow under the ice that we know is 100,000 years old, we take a sample of the lava flow surface, it has not seen any cosmic rays in its whole life. We know that the ice has been thicker, has been covering that, that lava flow for its entire life, which gives us some information about past ice sheet things. So that's the basic idea. I'm not going to get into a lot more detail. But, that, but this is a, so first season was mapping out the lava flows. We brought the samples home to New Mexico Tech. We dated them in the Argonne Lab. And the next field season, we'll be drilling down to sample those lava flows sub-ice. So it's a very elegant, interesting project. Point out the uh, blockage of the cosmic rays by the ice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So <clears throat> cosmic rays are absorbed by ice. So if the lava flow, even they're absorbed by snow. If, you, if there's a meter of snow on something, cosmic rays cannot get through that snow ice <coughs> cover to interact. But why doesn't the lava at least melt? I mean, snow for sure. Oh, when it ice. erupted, it melted everything. But then, you know, say that lava flow, and you see this in Kamchatka, you have a lava flow that's coming down the slope, <coughs> it hits ice, it tunnels under that ice, it melts its way through the ice, but but it, it doesn't, if the ice locally melts, it quickly reforms as that lava flow um, cools. Well, there's yeah. a increase in cosmic rays at Antarctica, right? Because yes. there's a hole yes. in the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you do get a higher flux. You get a higher flux, but not higher penetration. Right, yeah. No, and yeah. and there, there have actually been some really nice studies on Mount Erebus. There have been some cosmic ray detectors, because there's also the elevation um, aspect of cosmic rays. So you get higher flux of cosmic rays at higher elevation. So if the lava was exposed to the atmosphere, you definitely would see an increased cosmic ray, cosmic ray flux. Correct, yes. And if we were, when we were measuring those cosmic rays, we would apply a correction for latitude and also for altitude. Um, so in the 2018-2019 field season, which was super fun, we went to Mount Weishi, we stayed there a month, we, we mapped the lava flows on the flanks of the volcanoes, produced this really beautiful geologic map, and then brought those samples home to date. And then the other thing that was going on during that same field season is our colleagues from the University of Maine we're driving snowmobiles out here on the ice, look at, using a radar to look at the sub-ice topography. And this is, this is an example of one of those radar images. So here's the current ice level at zero. And you can see the top, this line shows the sub-ice topography. So the radar is looking through the ice at the surface of the lava flow. And the, these images are what are going to allow us to choose our drilling locations. And when we drill in the next field season, we're going to drill close to the volcano and then stepping out further, 
because that will give us insight into different potential ice levels in the next. Okay, and this is the Mount Weishi field team, and this is our summer day. So we were up at the top of Mount Weishi, which is what, 11, 8? I don't remember how high it is. About 11. Yeah, about 11,000 feet. It was darn cold that day, so we're all bundled up. So this is me. This is this is Robert Acker, who is our collaborator, who was at Harvard when we had the project funded. He's now retired and he's at University of Maine. This is Seth, he's Mr. Radar, and he's at University of Maine. He just got an NSF Career Award, which is really exciting. He's a terrific scientist. There's Bill, and there's Matt Zimmer, who is the principal investigator from New Mexico Tech, the young scientist, and then Jeremy, who was our master's student. And this kind of rock, this beautiful red cindery rock, tells us that when this, when the, when the volcano erupted, this was erupted into air. There was no ice, there was no water at this location during the eruption. This is a lava flow, so a nice thick lava flow like we're seeing here in Hawaii. And again, this would have been erupted in a dry environment. But here, in contrast, is something called a pillow lava. And so this is a blob of magma in a fracture in this <coughs> so Yesterday, Nels talked about the fuel coolant reaction. The magma interacts with ice fragments into tiny pieces and then it alters to this yellowish color, kind of like the alteration on the surface of the lava flows we saw when we drove out to the beach today. And then this blob of lava would have, would have burrowed its way into this kind of wet slurry of hyaloplastite. So when you see something like this, it tells you that when this eruption was going on, it was interacting with ice and or water. And again, if this is above current ice sheet level, we can date this and we can get a pinning point for when the ice sheet was there. Okay, so summary of the 2018-2019 field season. We had a 26 field days. We only lost one day to bad weather. This West Antarctic area has, traditionally can have some terrible weather, but Mount Weishi has this great little kind of triangle of good weather downwind, which we've taken advantage of a number of times. Um, this is our little field camp at Mount Weishi and the summit of the volcano. Um, we mapped 90% of the exposed rocks on this volcano. Now, obviously there's a lot of ice and snow in this volcano, so it's not 100% exposure, but we pretty much mapped everything we could get to. Um, we took 110 samples for, for dating at the Argon Lab in Socorro. We dated 71 of those. We took 50 samples for cosmogenic exposure dating to understand something about the surface of the volcano. We did 1,000, not we, Seth, did 1,000 kilometers of ground penetrating radar skidoo work and going, it was, yeah, we had a really exciting season, Seth had a really boring season, he was <laughs> driving a snowmobile at like five kilometers an hour all day, every day. And then we also selected some preliminary drill sets. Um, and the drilling again will happen in the next field season. So I mentioned that um, you know, we're only partway through this project and the, the, the objectives of the project from the proposal are yet to be determined because we've got to drill to do that. However, as in many science projects, the dating work that has been done so far on this volcano has shown us something really interesting and it actually ties into some of the things Nels was talking about on Hawaii. So this is a graph that shows age in thousands of years on the horizontal axis and shows argon dates. Each of these little black dots with an error bar is an argon age. Mm -hmm. On this diagram, the white band are glacial periods in the Earth's past. And the brown bands are interglacials when there was less ice in Antarctica. And the thing that comes out of this data set that is really fascinating is 76% of the eruptions at Mount Weishi over the last 450,000 years occurred during interglacial periods. And this is something that many people have wrestled with, they, the, the relationship between glaciation and volcanic eruptions. And there are data, some data sets that suggest that when, the, when a place is glaciated, you get more volcanic eruptions because you have more pressure on the Earth's crust. Other studies that suggest when you deglaciate and release the pressure, that's when eruptions happen. And the Weishi data suggest really strongly that deglaciation is triggering eruptions in this volcano in Antarctica. 
And the model for that would be when during the glacial period, when the ice is thicker, you've got compression. And that's suppressing the eruptions. When you deglaciate, you extend the crust and you get decompression melting and higher degrees of volcanism. And this is interesting because this is not something that was part of the proposal, but it's some, it's some really interesting data set that's fallen out of the work that we've been doing here. Largely in the maps anyway. Okay, so that's the science part, and now I'm going to go on to the kind of travel log part. Are there any questions about the science part before we move? Okay, so working in Antarctica, um, when we travel to Antarctica, the first place we go is called McMurdo Station. This is McMurdo Station. It's on Ross Island, which is that island formed of coalesced volcanoes. And it is the place where Captain Scott had one of his huts that he used as a jumping off point for his, um, uns well, unsuccessful in that he died on the way back, expedition to South Pole. So he did make it to South Pole, he didn't make it back. And so this Ross Island, where Mount Erebus is located, has been a kind of focus of human activity for, for over 100 years. McMurdo Station is devoted to support of science. So this is the big science lab called the Prairie Science Lab. This is the dining hall and dormitory. This is medical with the red roof. Um, these are other, a whole set of dormitories for housing scientists and support people and, and actually pilots all live in this special form over here. Um, we've got the science center, the mechanic shop. Um, so this is a whole kind of, oh yeah, and this is, this is called Mac Ops. This is the communication center and they do weather here. And the helicopter pad is just off the, off the edge of the screen here. So this, this is a whole community of people who mostly come for the summer. Some people are there for a full field season. Um, and it's all, everyone, here is devoted to making science happen. Actually, I pointed. This is these are dormitories. This is the science center. Here. Point out the ice pier. Oh yeah, this is the ice pier. So this this is water. This is um this is ocean. It's an inlet, and you can also see. You know, it takes a lot of energy to fuel McMurdo. You can see these fuel tanks over here, and every year a cargo ship and a fuel ship come to McMurdo and they pull up. This is a big block of ice called the ice pier with bollards on it, and the ship pulls up here, ties up, and they can offload the fuel and offload the cargo. And then they also load on all of the garbage from McMurdo. So everything, all waste generated in McMurdo goes back to the United States. And the recycling system in McMurdo is unlike anything you've ever seen. Like, there's not one trash can, there's 20 trash cans. And you've got to sort all your waste into all these quite, uh, detailed categories. And then all the food waste in Antarctica goes back to Washington State where it's burned in a waste to energy program. So that's kind of an interesting, and now when we were first here, when we were working in Antarctica in the early 80s, what they did with the garbage, they put it on an ice floe, pushed it out, and dynamited it. Um, and they stopped doing that. <laughs> so even though that was fun, you know, it's, uh, they recognized that was not the thing. That was the Navy who was doing that work. Um, and now everything is recycled. So it's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting environment. And there's people who work in Antarctica for their entire careers. You know, they work there during the winter, and then during the summer they go live in Fiji or something and then come back the next year. Is, mm -hmm. this, is this only a U.S. base? Or is it yes, is this is only a U.S. base, but it does support a lot of international science. And there's just a couple kilometers from this base is a place called Scott Base. It's a New Zealand base. And so there different countries, and then there's a German base and an Italian base within a couple hundred kilometers. There's a Korean base that's close by. So there are, you know, there's bases representing the countries that are, that are treaty nations. But, and they're all got different projects. Yes, yeah, they all have different projects, but there are a lot of collaborative projects. So in McMurdo, typically, there are people from all different countries who are doing collaborative work with U.S. science. And there's some big projects, big drilling projects, that are very much international projects. And sometimes they're based in McMurdo, sometimes other places. So it is, it's, um, you know, although all the bases kind of belong to a specific country, there's a lot of, a lot of collaboration and kind of transparency between the different programs. And, and some of the projects are so expensive, you know, no one country can support it themselves. So they get 
collab, you know, collaboration. So you're not fighting over territory over there, huh? No, <laughs> we're not. And interestingly, you know, many countries claim parts of Antarctica, but their claims are held in advance. West Antarctica, the place where we often work, no country claims that because the weather is super bad there, so <laughs> no one would want that part of Antarctica. Is this summer here? <coughs> yeah, this is summer. So this would be in November, December. And you can see Ross Island is pretty much snow and ice free. Now, if I turned around and looked up at Erebus, there is, there is parts of Ross Island are glaciated. But part of the reason that Scott chose this place to set up his hut is that it's so snow free and ice free. So it's an easy place to, to um, build things. So they're bringing in, I mean, what type of fuel are they bringing in and then how are they generating it? Diesel. Yeah, they bring in diesel and there's the power plant. There's the power plant. Um, it's up the hill. But there's also wind power and yeah. there are, they're working on other renewable possibilities. Yeah. And they, they and did have a... Be, there used to be a nuclear reactor here. But that didn't work out that well. And then in the field, we have we use a lot of solar and wind in the field. And so when we're in the deep field, we have these solar pods, so we can generate enough power to say recharge a laptop. Um, during so the summer, but it's sunny all the during time. During the summer, yes, yeah. Not in the winter, mm -hmm. when it's dark all the time. So what's your water supply? Where does that come from? Well, in McMurdo, they desalinate seawater mm -hmm. because they have pretty high water demand, and obviously there's not much snow and ice around. So there's a desal plant, and um, and you know you have to be fairly conservative with water. So you take these things called rain showers and turn on the water, get wet, turn off the water, soap up, turn on the water, rinse off. Um, and so and, and a little bit less now. It used to, there's more water available now. It used to be pretty strict. I think they used to only allow one shower a week, um, like back in the day. And then when we're out in the field, we're basically on a no shower program because when you're in the deep field, every drop of water you use, you have to melt from snow and ice. And and that takes fuel, and you know you can't take an unlimited amount of fuel in the deep field. So we're pretty, so in the deep field, we melt ice. If you have ice, it's it's the best, because it melts more easily than snow. But we melt all our, all our water from, from snow and ice. So for drilling, are they gonna airlift in like your core rigs? Yes, where it's gonna come in on a twin otter. So it's a, it's a portable, portable rig. And we've used them before in other places, and the, and the, the heaviest piece is about 300 pounds. So, you know, with, with four people, you can move it around pretty easily. And then oh. it gets assembled in the field. Are they winky drills, or what are they? Yeah, we're taking a winky and also an eclipse drill. Oh, okay. so, um, eclipse for the ice, winky for the rock. Yeah, winky for the rock, eclipse for the ice. Um, so they're, they're pretty straightforward. And we will have a couple of drillers yeah. with us, which is good, because yes. the drilling can be tricky. Okay. You poop in a bucket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you pee into bottles and you dump that into a big bucket. Yeah. 55 gallon drum. And then it gets shipped to Washington and incinerated. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah, when we're in the field, so yeah. 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 if we're in an accumulation area, we actually can leave human yeah. waste behind, but in general, we bring out all human waste. Wow. Um, yeah. And <laughs> when you're going out into the field with six or eight people for six or eight weeks, you have to take a lot of food. And this is my personal superpower, is I can plan food like nobody's business. So, <laughs> so I, I can just, uh, it just works for me. So this is, there's me planning food. And this is all the food that we would be taking with us. Actually, all the dried and canned food. I, I'm not showing the frozen food here. But this is the amount of food that six people are going to eat in five weeks. And um, we then pack it up into rock boxes. These are rock boxes here. And interestingly, when you're a bunch of geologists in the field, the number, of the amount, the volume of rocks you collect is about the same as the volume of food you're eating. <laughs> and so we take the food out in these wooden boxes, and as we eat the food, we Good consolidate job. the food, and we use the, we use the rock boxes to pack our rocks in to bring the samples. Um, so, and, and when we're in the deep field, you're getting no resupply flights. So you cannot forget things. You have to be really careful in your planning. And, um, you know, like if you forget some food, someone's going to be grumpy about it. But if you miscalculate your fuel or, you know, miscalculate, um, yeah, most of your fuel. That, or the number of matches you bring, that's most important. But, you know, it's, it's not a situation. You don't want that to happen. So you do have to kind of plan and replan over and over again. Yeah. 
and we're somewhat weight limited, but not hugely weight limited. And this is how we get to the deep field. So this is a ski-equipped Hercules aircraft called an LC-130. And um, so you can see the skis here. Yeah, here are the skis. And the skis have like a Teflon coating. And the wheels are, the skis can be pulled up into the body of the plane. The wheels, the wheels are still on the plane. They don't swap out wheels for skis. But the skis just drop down over the wheels. And this is our equipment being loaded into the back of the Herc. And this is what the inside of the Herc looks like when you're about ready to take off. So here are our snowmobiles, our fuel, our tents, and then all of our other stuff is underneath that. And this is the most comfortable seat in the, in the Herc when you're going out to the deep field is on top of the gear. Um, and then for Mount Weishi, because we couldn't land the LC-130 right by our field site, we went to an intermediate camp called Waste Divide, and we offloaded everything out of the herd. This is all, of, and then we loaded it onto Twin Otter and a Basler, which is an old DC-3 that's been retrofitted with skis. And this is how we got Waste Divide was a what 200 kilometers from Weishi, and we shuttled, brought everything to, to Waste Divide, divided everything up, split it up into these planes, and then we're shuttled out to Mount Weishi in the smaller area. The DC-3 also is outfitted with turboprop jet yeah. engines yeah. as well. The original engines were just piston engines. So that's a plane from the 50s that's been rebuilt and repurposed. And you can see here. Are we still flying the U-2? <laughs> <laughs> this, one of the great things about having the Basler as part of the picture is it's got a big door and a ramp. And so you can drive the snowmobiles up into the Basler. Getting a snowmobile into a twin otter is yeah. a total nightmare. <laughs> and they put these two like like just sandpaper covered four by fours, and then they get someone to drive the snowmobile up that super steep ramp into this little skinny door. And then you gotta like they don't want you to drive it out the other side of the plane, so you have to drive really carefully. It's super nerve wracking. The doors are really fragile. The doors are really fragile. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was really nice having the Basler. Um, and this is the flight out, and this is the neighboring volcano to Mount Weishi. It's called Mount Sidley. It's the biggest volcano in Antarctica. I think it's 14,000 14, feet high. And you can see this giant crater. It probably had a really big eruption at some point. It blew that, blew that crater out. It's like Mount St. Helens blown out sideways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is landing at our field site. So Twin Otter landed and um, off, is offloading all of our stuff. There's Bill checking out the stuff. And um, then they, tomorrow. what's that? Take your luggage tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Eight o'clock. <laughs> and then the, the plane flew yes. away. Here's the, here's the little speck of the plane leaving us. And we set up our beautiful, we had the most beautiful camp that way. So this is our camp. Um, we've got a, a cook tent, kind of a cook and living tent here. And then um, we had six people on camp that year, so we had, we had uh, Bill, this is Bill's and my tent, and then two other living tents, and then we had a toilet tent, actually this is the toilet tent, and these are the living tents. Um, and another beautiful picture, it's just such a pretty spot. Mm -hmm. And this is, our, this is our fleet of snow machines here. And now, there, we know there's evidence that Mount Weishi can be extremely windy. And so we built snow walls, not around our living tents, but around our cook tent, which is probably the, the most critical tent to keep some kind of break, to break the wind um, in case of it being really windy. But we got lucky this year and it was not that windy. Uh, there's a close up of our snow wall. And here's all our rock boxes piled around the uh, flaps. So these tents have big snow flaps that come out to kind of anchor them down. And we pile all of our food on the snow flaps. And then again, as we eat the food, we replace that with rocks and that's a good anchor for the tent. We're burning propane in our cook stoves. Here's the propane tank. And we used to burn white gas, and now they switched over to propane, which is actually a lot easier to deal with. And it doesn't get on your hands and make your hands really cold when you're, when you're refueling the stoves. Here's our fleet of snow machines and our pink sled there. And we have a little gas station. You can't see a 55-gallon drum of, of premix that we pump into the snow machines to refuel them. And here's our power station. There's our solar panel um, for being able to keep a few computers going. 
And again, there's another view of our camp um, with the living tents with gear piled around them. And um, what elevation? Are you at? We're at about 6,000 feet here. But we're on, we're on the ice sheet, so we're a place where the ice sheet is about 6,000 feet. Here. And this is what the inside of the cook tent looks like. So we've got a couple of Coleman camping stoves, um, and you can see there's a tube going out to the propane. Water is a huge thing, and so you're always making water. You know, when you have six people in camp and it's so dry and you're working really hard, you're you're constantly drinking water. And so this is our big water, our big um, water cooker, and we'd be making water in this pan, transferring into that pan, and one day, you know every day one person's job is to go get ice, bring it back, and kind of keep the water supply going. Um, this is this is kind of um, easy, easy to get to food, hot chocolate, tea, hot tea, we drink a lot of hot tang, spices and things, crackers, cereal, and um, and then all of our uh, urine or gray water, we take out with us, it, it's poured into these, U, this is U gray barrel, which is urine gray water. So we don't pour anything on the ice. Um, and uh, let's see what's next. Yeah. So another shot of the cook tent, and this is breakfast. I think we're having. And for breakfast, usually we have like bagels. If it's a good weather day. We have bagels, cold cereal, toast, um, hot chocolate. If it's a bad weather day, we might like put pancakes or French toast or something. Um, and so we eat a lot, and you know you're burning a lot of energy in the cold. Um, and uh, again, kind of. Food and water is, is a constant. When you're in the deep field in Antarctica, you're basically doing science or supporting living. That's so pretty much the funny. weather and wind? Well, um, at, at Weishi, it was, we actually had really good weather. It was typically about 15 degrees Fahrenheit, like minus, right? minus 5, minus 10 Celsius. And, um, you know, there's always, often a little bit of wind. It's rare to have a completely calm day. But if the wind's less than about 20 knots, you can work perfectly well. Um, and, you know, you bundle up, and you just kind of get used to living in that, that environment. So. Why don't you keep, like, the urine like, waste? The urine's actually outside. Oh, we're not pouring the urine in the tent. Oh, <laughs> like, what? No. In the kitchen and not. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a good question, actually. And, and the, the barrel, so we use the same drums for urine or gray water. So if the, if um, the drum is inside the tent, it's for gray water, which is outside the tent, it's for okay. urine. So, so, yeah, I should mention that. Um, and so, again, here we are after dinner, kind of washing some dishes. And and we try, so for the, for your, Plates and bowls and things. We each had an assigned set that we kept in a Ziploc bag, clipped to the side of the tent, and and then you were responsible for washing those and then the kind of communal dishes. Someone, whoever, two people cook and then two people clean up every day, and we kind of have a rotating schedule there. Um, what else about camp? Anything else about camp? No. Good. Okay. And this is what we do a lot of the time: is we are getting our snowmobiles in the morning, driving someplace up on this volcano and examining the rocks. And it's really wonderful. And I think for most of us, you know, who have kind of busy lives and are pulled in lots of different directions every day, being able to be in this place and focusing just on geology for a month is just a gift. It's so wonderful and, and it's really um, exhilarating. So a lot of work up and down the flanks of the volcano. And <laughs> this, this is a GPS track. <laughs> All the places we went. So, so this is uh, a picture of the outcrops. Our camp would be, actually our camp's a little bit It's not the counting picture. the radar. Yeah, it's not counting the radar, actually, yeah, because the radar was a lot. Um, but this is we're doing the geology. This, these are all the different places we went during the field season, including a summit day. So here's the summit crater. So we drove up here, from here, and back and forth up here. I don't know what happened there. And then we were in the summit. Um, and it was a really fantastic day. And um, every, every place we go, we're checking out the rocks and sampling rocks, uh, walking around, taking notes. This is Jeremy, the student, sitting on a giant volcanic bomb, actually. <laughs> 
and taking surface samples for cosmogenic dating. This is Robert. He's got a, uh, a chisel. Chisel. Yeah. Chisel, and he's, he's chipping off a surface of rock to take a cosmogenic sample. Um, here's all of us on a slightly snowy day working together on examining this rock and taking notes. Lunch. Everybody loves lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and um, we usually have hot breakfast and hot dinner, but then lunch we eat in the field. And so it's very, uh, you know, typical lunch would be nuts, you know, gorp, nuts, raisins, and things. Peanut butter, peanut butter, it has to get really cold before peanut butter is not spreadable. So peanut butter is a really great thing to have in the field. We have these crackers, big thick crackers called cabin bread, spread the peanut butter on that. Uh, chocolate, hot drink, nuts, that's lunch. Sometimes eaten on the outcrop, sometimes eaten so. Do you check in daily with yes. one of us? Yes, we have Iridium phones. And so we have to check in once a day, report on, you know, make sure everything's fine. And probably many of you have heard about some of the sexual harassment things that have happened in Antarctica that are pretty horrific in the deep field. And um, one of the things that the program has done now is every field party has two Iridium phones. One is held by the most senior field party member, one's held by the most junior field party member. And, and the rationale for that is there have been some instances where Someone's been in the field, has been uncomfortable, and has not been given access to any comms. So there's no way they can call out and you know, report a problem. So that's a that's a modification that they made. This is actually this is called pretty cone, a really beautiful little little uh, cinder cone, like in Hawaii. And you can see our tracks going across there when we were doing work. And when this was erupting, it would look like this, which is a Hawaiian volcano. So um, 100,000 years ago. Another, this is, this is called Pistol's Crown. Actually, this is another really cool thing. None of these things are named. None of these features are named when we first visit these places. So we get to name everything. And that's, that's kind of fun. Um, here are some, some evidence of, um, remind me of what is this? I can't remember where this is. I think that's just pyroclastic fall, isn't it? Yeah, the wall of the cone. So, so this, the yeah. flanks of, of one of the cinder cones. And this is from high up looking down. This is our camp here. And one of the things, one of the pieces of evidence that is so that it often is very windy on Mount Erebus is Mount F, Mount Weishis. You can see the fluting on this rock. And when we were first looking at this, we thought it might be glacially related to glaciers because this these rocks are actually sitting on some glacial till, this rumbly surface here. But what we realized actually is this is wind fluting on the rock showing that sometimes it is extremely windy. Here it is. So you can see this rock has been completely polished by wind. Those are big rocks compared to what we see in here. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's a, that was part of the lava flow. And so that would be quite massive. It's almost like the racetrack of Death Valley. Yeah, it is a little bit like that, yeah. And um, again, a lot of radar work. I'm a little short on time here. And um, this is the, the, what the sub ice topography. So here's the ice surface, and we're looking down at what things would look like under the ice. Uh, this was Christmas dinner, chicken cordon bleu, which was huh. fantastic. And another fantastic meal bacon wrapped scallops. <laughs> Pretty wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, anything that breaks down, we have to fix ourselves. And Bill is a fantastic mechanic. And this is Bill and Jeremy working on one of our chainsaws that we had up there for cutting ice, trying to get it going again. And sometimes the snowmobiles break down in the field and then you've got to fix them where they break. And here's Bill doing a, a field-based repair on one of our snowmobiles. And fixing one of our drills. So a certain amount of fixing that goes on. And a beautiful picture of the summit of Mount Weishi. And the moon. And the moon, yeah. And this is, uh, some of the summits of these volcanoes have these huge ice mushrooms on them. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing here. There's a person for scale, just incredibly beautiful. And this is looking, this is from the summit of Mount Weishi, looking down at Mount Sidney, the volcano I showed you earlier with the big crater. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking across the ice sheet at Mount Sidney. Like looking at Maui okay. from... Yeah, like, yeah, like looking yeah. at Maui and Hawaii. How many hours of day or night? 
zero hours of nighttime. <laughs> it is light all the time. And when so we're there. In the winter, it's dark all the time. And actually, that is a real, that's a wonderful aspect of doing field work in Antarctica, is you never have to worry about getting home before it gets dark, because it never gets dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you don't, and, and another interesting thing about that is when you're out in the field, you tend to get into this good weather, bad weather sleep cycle, more than like a day-night sleep cycle. So when the weather's really good, we're up, you know, many, many hours a day. And then when the weather turns bad, you just sleep, you know, sleep for days and while the weather's bad. And at Weishi, with so much good weather, we were getting kind of worn out, and we eventually had to kind of set aside, like we would take Sunday morning off and just relax and like fix gear and stuff instead of go, go, go. Because usually you're kind of go, 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 waiting for the weather to turn bad, and then you can rest. But because we had so much good weather, we didn't really have the luxury of doing that. Here's some pretty wind clouds over oh, Weishi. Oh, the TV station. <laughs> <laughs> There's none of that. <coughs> we play a lot of cards when we're in the field. So. Mm -hmm. And was the, the good weather season, was that just um, just a, a fluke year? You know, was it typical? I've been, was to, it? I've been to Weishi four times, and we rarely had much bad weather. I think it's okay. just a weird little something about the shape of the volcano and the prominent wind direction. And I think the other side of Weishi, the weather can be quite bad, and we're just in this, in this little triangle, downwind triangle that has surprisingly good weather. So that's pretty typical for you when you're there. Yeah, yeah, it has been. Now, not to say that it will always, always be. Sure. You could have bad times there. And this is just some beautiful wind clouds over the volcano. Um, looking down through some of the clouds. And so it's going to have a little fun. There's blue ice areas at Mount Weishi, and our student, Jeremy, knew about these, so he brought his ice skates. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Jeremy ice skating <laughs> on Antarctica. <laughs> and then it did as well. <laughs> so it's not the smoothest ice in the world. And this is for the skiers in the crowd. <laughs> Late in that season, we had a snowfall, and so we had some fresh powder. And some people had their skis there and did a few ski runs down the side of the Mount Wishing Volcano. A chairlift was a heck of a ride. What's yeah, that? I said the chairlift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is our snowmobile chairlift. <laughs> 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 using NSF dollars, not for good, but anyway, it is good to have a little entertainment. And that's it. Thank you for this. Neil, one of your earlier maps, you showed uh, Dome C, mm -hmm. and that's a um, potential uh, astronomical site. Oh, really? Right? Uh, how would that affect your they want to build, there's always been a proposal to build a really big telescope there. Hmm. That would be. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the middle of nowhere, Dome, Dome C. C. Is, yeah. <laughs> Dome C is the definition Dome of middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's out in East Antarctica, it's on the East Antarctica ice sheet. And there have been, there have been cores drilled at Dome C. I mean, Dome C has had a presence for a long time. It's, I think it's darn cold at Dome C. Apparently it's really yeah. close to the hole where the Oh, okay. in the that would make sense, yeah. So uh, I think it would be a logistically tricky place to have a telescope. It's pretty far. They do have a telescope at the South Pole, right? Yeah, South Pole is a telescope, yeah. But South Pole is closer to the Northern Pole. But all telescopes are remotely operated nowadays. Really? They have no one on site? Mostly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.